is tricky. All horror is, for that matter. It's a genre where you have to generate suspense or fear, but not too little and not too much. You have to slowly show the audience your hand, but not too slowly and definitely not too quickly. One small slip up and all the things you've been working up towards can just be lost in an instant. Hi, I'm Danny or Chase or Neither, and I really, really like analog horror. Kinda. I don't actually know if it's possible to label what could be classified as the first analog horror, maybe something like No True Road or Local 58 or something like that, but as a genre, it's something that's just kind of slowly developed over time and just exploded in popularity recently. And throughout all that time, there have been some real winners and some real somethings. Don't take this as me trying to discourage indie horror creators. I'm not. I doubt I could even begin to create something half as put together as any analog horror series or game or book. But horror as a genre is incredibly tricky, and there is definitely a fine line between the horror that works and the horror that tries to cash in on shock, disgust, or stuff like jump scares. I've been around for a minute. Well, according to Google, I've been around for a minimum of 11,563,200 minutes, but in those minutes, I've played, watched, and experienced a lot of different takes on horror countless different attempts at figuring out what makes something truly scary. Scariness is very subjective. I find something like the ocean and other bodies of water to be horrifying, thus games like Subnautica are terrifying to me. But someone might find a game like Subnautica to be more akin to a relaxing vacation. But I think there's one thing that we can all agree on that is, or at least would be, genuinely frightening. Meat. That's right, if you couldn't tell by the title or the thumbnail of the video that you literally clicked on yourself, today we're diving into the rare but well-done world of Vita Carnet. <laughs> that was stupid. Whoa there gamers, thanks for making it this far in the video. If you're seeing this, then you might be liking this video, and if you like this video, I'm sure I have and will have other content that you'll enjoy, so why not hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with the channel? Thank you, and now, please enjoy the rest of the video. Before we dive into the series of Vita Carnis itself, let me ask you a question. What is horror, and why are we afraid of it? Being the eager beaver that you are, you may be tempted to say that horror is just anything that's scary. And if that's the route you're going to take, then don't be surprised when I hit you back with, okay, so what's scary? Death? Gore? Maybe the supernatural? All of these are good answers, but I don't think even taken together they give up a complete answer. I'm not going to claim to have the be-all, end-all answer to the question of what is horror. That's a really big, important question, but I'm going to try and at least push us in that direction, because in my opinion, I think horror should be seen as less of just like its own outstanding genre, and more of something like a vessel, something that can deliver a message, or something deep and personal up front in our faces. By this, I mean that horror is usually that which, typically through unnatural or unsettling means, will raise questions or concerns about society, or challenge our beliefs about fear, or even elicit shock or empathy from the audience. That's not a 100% accurate definition, but let's just take that for now and press on with the second part of the question, which is, why are we afraid of horror? If you watch a slasher film, it may seem obvious why we'd be afraid of whatever situation is occurring. A guy in a mask chasing you with a knife to try and kill you doesn't sound like my cup of tea for a Saturday evening either, but what exactly is scaring us here? And what about horror that isn't as in your face as slashers? One of my favorite examples of subtle yet brilliant horror writing is Jack London's To Build a Fire. If you've never read it before, I'm sure you can find a PDF of it online or something. Please go read this. Even after a hundred years, it is still absolutely gut-wrenchingly suspenseful. The plot of the story basically follows a man as he travels through a snowy forest with his dog. However, he severely underestimates just how cold and harsh the conditions are going to be. He finds himself needing to start a fire in order to survive, but every single chance he takes to start a fire is thwarted by something. Though simple in premise, the phrasing and vivid descriptions of everything that go on in To Build a Fire make it just a wonderfully horrific story where you can just see and feel and experience everything going on with the main character. And I'd even argue that something like To Build a Fire and Halloween would tell one and the same story. Stories about hope. Horror is so often about the hope that we feel, even if what we're hopeful for seems impossible. Why, even after having his fire snuffed out once, does the man attempt to rebuild his fire at all? Why do people run from Michael Myers and Jason? Though you may say that the answer is fear, the people in these stories would only act this way if they thought they had a chance to get away from danger, even if they were afraid of it. Don't believe me? Well, rude. But more importantly, there's a much more modern example of this hope and horror phenomena that actually ties into the main crux of this video in analog horror. Let's talk about Kane Pixels. If that name doesn't ring a bell for you, then you should definitely subscribe and ring that bell. Then you are likely much more familiar with his work at the very least. His very recent analog horror series, The Oldest View, and his much more popular series, The Backrooms. 
backrooms as a concept is always something that's really just unsettled me. It's irked me in a way that other things haven't. I mean, can you just imagine going through what the character in the backroom series goes through? I mean, you fall through reality just to end up somewhere with the scale and composition that you can't even begin to understand. It looks human, but it very clearly isn't. And since you got in, you might think that you have a way out, right? Right. You wander through the endless yellow hallways for hours. You can't shake this feeling that you're somehow being watched. And right when you let your guard down just for a moment. Why run? You're in an otherworldly, potentially interdimensional place that doesn't seem to end ever. It seems like humans have been here, but everything is distorted and twisted. A monster that your brain can't even begin to describe is attempting to hunt you down. And yet, you still run. These are not the acts of a hopeless person. As a matter of fact, in the original canon of the Backrooms, the only way to properly escape was to abandon your hope and give in to your fear, go against your instincts to survive. The fight for survival and our self-preservation instincts are weirdly powerful things. Even when we face the incomprehensible, we still try to keep going to some extent. And over the years, there have been many creative geniuses that have been working to try and capture that mind-boggling instinct and exploit it for whatever purpose they might be doing. And it's here that I think we need to start talking about the main focus of this video, hope, horror, and fear found in the analog horror series Vita Carnis. Vita Carnus is a YouTube analog horror series set in an alternate universe where a new species of creatures have just appeared on Earth. They get dubbed the Vita Carnus, living meat. These creatures are unlike anything else we have ever seen before. They exploded on the scene in the 1930s, look like intestines and skinned animals and all the other delicious things in the world, and they also seem to spell major danger for humanity. In this video, I'm not attempting to explain the lore of Vita Carnus, the cult conspiracies and the government's internal corruption and all that stuff. There are plenty of other videos that explain that way better than I could do right now, and there are a few of them on screen right now if that's what you're interested in. Instead, today, I want to go through and kind of dissect, no pun intended, each of the Carnus creatures and find out why exactly we're terrified of them. I mean, sure, I very easily could just say, Oh, well, I, this one's scary because this one eats us, and this one is just creepy, and this one's a... ball. But I don't feel like doing that. Those are the easy routes. So in this video, we're going to be looking at Vita Carnus and horror a bit more in depth. And that all begins... Right now, what are the lines? That begins with the one that started it all, The Crawl. Vita Carnus starts off primarily presenting itself as a documentary created by Living Meat Research, with each entry of the documentary giving us a bit of backstory and insight into the world of and various family members within Vita Carnus. The first and potentially most important of which is The Crawl. The Crawl are these meaty red vines that apparently look like intestines, likely don't smell great, and probably taste just as good as real red vines. The most unique thing about the crawl is that without it, there wouldn't be any of the other Carnus species we learn about in the documentary. With one exception, it's the only Carnus capable of making other Carnies. A common trope in horror is the use of the uncanny. It's almost like an exploitable glitch in our brains, and everything in Vita Carnus is basically perfect for scaring us in this regard. Our brains love patterns, we like to recognize and know things. However, when our brains believe they recognize something kind of, but something else seems off about it, it can very easily cause distress and fear. In Vita Carnus, the crawl, as our first example, is said to grow like a plant or fungus, yet, as mentioned earlier, resembles the small intestine. Put these two things together, the familiarity of plant life and the general revulsion towards our innards, and you have a recipe for fear. We and many other creatures are hardwired to be disgusted by things that could be poisonous, diseased, or otherwise bad for our health, whether that be blood or guts or all the other gushy stuff. And when you have disgust, you can very easily find fear nearby. Fear and disgust go together like my hand and my other hand. The documentary then starts to go into detail about the other Carnus species, ramping up in intensity and danger level as it does. The first two, the trimmings and the meat snakes, are pretty much harmless, but then after that we start to get into the really bloody, gushy, mushy bits. Trimmings and meat snakes further lean into this uncanny trope, which is something that we'll be seeing a lot of throughout this video. But they do it in a much more different way than the crawl. They remind us of various flora that we find here on Earth. Trimmings are one of the clearest examples of this trope. Not only do they just look like some skinned animal, yum, but we're even directly told that they look like skinned raccoons with some other interesting features. If you're arachnophobic, then you know all too well that the number of legs that spiders have is definitely one thing that makes them a creepy sight to behold. We naturally find things with too many appendages to be unnatural, and thus we're made uncomfortable. 
And what is one detail that we're made well aware of about the trimmings? They can have a multitude of limbs. Some may have four, others six, potentially eight, and possibly even more than that. This element of the unknown relating to their limb proportions and their odd, albeit kind of maybe cute, appearance and their unworldly noises <laughs> creates the perfect environment for our brains to basically go, oh my god, get it away from me. Maybe I want to hug it. I don't know. I'm scared. Identifying horror and the uncanny doesn't get any harder when we turn to the meat snake either. I mean, just look at its name, meat snake. Stop laughing. The meat snake also gives off the appearance of something we may find on Earth. To me, they strike me as oversized worms mixed with snakes. In fact, I would say they share a lot of their appearance with bloodworms, a species of worm that actually has fangs like a snake, and much like we learn about the meat snake, they basically eat anything as long as they can get it in their mouth, including dead animals. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier. These creatures that resemble things we already find fairly vile, certain species of worms, have just been blown up in proportion and they consume only dead things. If you're an animal in the wild trying to survive, then hanging around the creature that eats dead flesh is probably not the smartest move. However, it's after the meat snake that we get introduced to likely the most popular and or famous member of the Carnus family, the Mimic. Do I need to go over why these things scare us? I mean, I'm going to and you can't stop me, but I mean, just look at how they're depicted in the documentary. They're f***ing horrifying. With the rise of mascot horror, Five Nights at Freddy's, Garden of Ban Ban, and Poppy's Playtime and all those other things and all the million clones that come with it, I'm sure that all of us have become very familiar with the concept of the uncanny valley. It's an extension of the glitch of the uncanny that I mentioned earlier, this part of the human brain where as things start to look more human, there comes this tipping point where it really nosedives and starts to freak us out because it looks just too human to be anything else, but it's very clearly at the same time not a human. To say that mimics fall into that exact category is like saying the Canes are the best NHL team. It's just a fact. Unlike the crawl trimmings and meat snakes, the mimics are a creature that pose an actual danger to human safety. Not only are they hyper-intelligent hunters, once matured, they exclusively hunt humans. They take everything you think you know about modern human life and throw it out the window. Your place in the food chain? Definitely not at the top anymore. Your safety in your neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, right. And your security in your own home? Not when these boys come to town. The mimics actually remind me a lot of the main threat presented in another analog horror series, the Mandela Catalog and its alternates. Though alternates seem to be supernatural in nature and mimics aren't, alternates and mimics are two sides of the same coin in my eyes. Alternates, unlike mimics, don't seem to physically attack people. Instead, they rely on their ability to wage psychological warfare to try and slowly break people down over time. And one of the earliest encounters we see is a character trapped in their own room being taunted by an alternate outside. Let, 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 let me in my... I have a gift for you. you, you. I have a present. Mimics, on the other hand, are all about that physical warfare, baby, and they want you to know it. And what is the first cutaway we see in the documentary when it's talking about the Mimic? We see a character trapped in their room because of the threat. And both of the characters' tales end in tragedy, with the alternate getting their victim to, uh, unplug their controller? And the mimic, uh, unplugging their victim's controller. Alternates and mimics are both the perfect predators of humanity, just one capable of destroying our minds while the other is capable of destroying our bodies. By the way, this is me no way trying to insert myself into the Alex Kister drama. If you want to get involved with that yourself, you can. Just make sure to do your own research and come to your own conclusions, okay? I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. I see similarities, I point them out. We as the human race have long since moved past our days of just living in the wild. We don't even consider what we do surviving anymore, just kind of living our day-to-day -day life. But in the world of Vita Carnis, every single bit of that gets called into question. Even if you think the solution is just as simple as, well, get up and move somewhere that mimics don't live, like the woods, well, boy, do I have news for you. Harvesters are these weird growths that form on crawl branches, but instead of falling off, like my view count when I post Let's Plays, they continue to grow until they browse tentacles of their own. These tentacles come in two forms, spiky, and as I misspelled when first writing the script for this video, angle hair pasta. 
Only appearing in wooded areas, hiking trails, and the like, harvesters hunt by waiting for their prime targets to make their way onto the burrowed tentacles and then striking. The spiky tentacles inject a neurotoxin and an anticoagulant into the victim, while the angle hair pasta drags it under the ground to be digested. Harvesters and mimics, while they also clearly tap into some uncanny fear that we have, they also tap into what are called humanity's primordial fears. We're afraid of the dark, and we're afraid of heights, and we're afraid of isolation and stuff like that. But most importantly for this, we're afraid of predators. I doubt most of us live our day-to-day -day lives walking down the street picturing just some random creature jumping out and chasing us and trying to eat us. I mean, it could still happen, but in the world of Vita Carnis, you wouldn't have a choice whether or not that's something that you think about. Because just like 4chan, predation is everywhere. On top of their frightening appearance, we're also told that mimics are intelligent hunters, able to use furniture and clothing to disguise themselves, and also striking when we're at our most vulnerable. The documentary even lets us know that to better our odds of survival and avoid a mimic attack, it's best to always be around other people. I mean, I do laundry in my basement. There's a little section off to the side where there's a washer and dryer hooked up in a kind of corner, and I'd be lying if I said I have never had the thought this would be the perfect time for a mimic to get me. Yeah, I'm that cool. To avoid harvester attacks, just stay out of the woods, I guess. Their tentacles stretch out over 100 meters underground, or for the like-minded Americans here, a metric fuck ton of space. If you do get attacked by one, as we see in the episode titled Species Anomaly Report, then, well, just watch the video for yourself. Or don't. It's genuinely one of the most fucked analog horror videos I've ever witnessed. Great job, Darian. So to summarize thus far, Vita Carnus basically taps into the deep part of your monkey brain where you don't fully recognize things, or something's disgusting, or something wants to chase you down and kill you, all kinds of stuff like that. But what if there was something else that your brain couldn't even begin to comprehend? Enter the host, the monolith, and the singularity. Or don't, because that would be gross. It's specifically pointed out to us before much else that the host derives its name from the host of a party rather than a host to parasites. This is rather interesting as, depending on who you ask, it's generally believed that parties are much more fun than parasites. The host is another humanoid carny like the Mimic, although unlike the Mimic, the host lacks facial features in anything below the waist, instead having tendril-like appendages that it can use to root itself into the ground. Hosts also come equipped with spikes in their back, each one being able to shoot out these orange spores capable of MIND CONTROL. Something you may have noticed up to this point, both in Via Carnis and just kind of a lot of other horror in general, is that tentacles and tendrils and other weird appendages appear quite frequently, and that's definitely not by accident. Tentacles and tendrils in Vita Carnis are pretty much always depicted as being like limbs of these creatures, with the crawl literally being nothing but kind of tendrils. And in short, because the fact that tendrils are so otherworldly compared to the limbs that we're typically used to seeing, they just seem so alien and grotesque to us that we become slightly unnerved by them. Sure, the Mimic, for example, has completely humanoid features. It has a head, has a body, has arms, has legs, all those good things. But there are other things about the Mimic that make it an apparent threat to us. Meanwhile, something like the Host, it doesn't have a face and it doesn't even have legs, instead having these kind of alien crawly bits. Remember our conversation about the Uncanny? There's another side to this discussion that I was saving up until now, since I feel like this is the best place for it, and that is the discussion of the abject. While the uncanny is that which is familiar but unsettling, the abject is essentially anything that's repulsive, rejected, or otherwise othered by general society to the point that it's just not something you ought to deal with. It usually relates to bodies, insides, decomposition, and whatnot. And what is it that we're dealing with pretty much throughout the entirety of Vita Carnis? Creatures that look like skinned animals that eat people. A double whammy if ever there were one. Abject horror can be a lot harder to describe than uncanny horror. As uncanny horror is familiar but unsettling, abject horror is unfamiliar but unsettling. We shouldn't be seeing our inside bits, for example. That's why they're called inside bits. They need to stay inside, and when those inside bits become outside bits, we become repulsed and scared immediately. That's why we're scared of so many of the Carnus creatures. They remind us of things that we're not supposed to be seeing. This is all not to mention that we consider things like tentacles to be other than normal, so while we might not be quote-unquote afraid of them, we have developed a discomfort from them. I mean, think about creatures like The Thing or Cthulhu and stuff like that. Creatures that are definitely really tentacle-heavy that our minds just reject. And speaking of Cthulhu, imagine this. Trimmings and meat snakes are already harmless. You've managed to learn the best way to handle mimics all on your own, and harvesters aren't even a threat. You don't even live near the woods. But you do live in Canada, and so you look out your window every day and you get to see... These are monoliths. Not a ton is known about them, but what is known is that they're big... While most of the Carnus species appeared around 1931, the monoliths suddenly started appearing in the 1970s on a small island in Canada, surrounded by whatever the name of these parts are, I don't know. 
While mimics and harvesters might be threats to us on a regular basis, hell, even the host, something like the monolith is something that we can barely even begin to understand. I mean, to us, they just appear to be these big things that are standing around minding their own business until you get close to them. The story goes that there were two groups of people that tried to interact with the monolith at one point. The first one was a ground crew that got wiped out by a tentacle, and then the second one was an air crew that got wiped out by a devastating EMP after trying to destroy one of the monoliths. <laughs> Pretty weird, innit? Because of the overall mystery surrounding these large creatures, I think it's pretty safe to chalk them up into the category of cosmic horror. While the most famous cosmic horror story of all time is undoubtedly The Call of Cthulhu, a lot of what cosmic horror has to offer gets lost and the name itself gets misused quite often. While some interpret it to mean just large creatures and others use it to mean tentacle-related stories, please don't look that up, the actual point of cosmic horror is to challenge our understanding of, well, just about everything we know. There are a lot of different ways to think about the concept of cosmic horror, some of which, existentialism and absurdism, I touch on in my video about the game Lethal Company. Go ahead and give that a watch after this one. Cosmic horror is super easy to do wrong, but when it's done right, it's just... Oh, it's so good, guys! Luckily for Darian Quilloy, the creator of Vita Carnis, the monoliths and the next carny species that we're going to be talking about absolutely nailed it as cosmic terrors. Darian makes sure to not show the audience his hand too often about these things, and while this video is me trying to make sense of why these things are scary in their respective universe, the fact that not much is known about them is exactly what makes them scary. Their large, flesh-like bodies stand unmoving off the coast of Canada. We remain ignorant to whether or not these things can even be considered alive until a few unlucky souls get sent to try and interact with them, only to be destroyed instantly. Knowing that these things possess such power to the point not even the military seems to be able to deal with them would definitely make some people lose sleep. Do they have wants? Do they have desires? Are they conscious? Are they single? What exactly are the monoliths? Hopefully with season two, which is coming just around the corner, we get a step closer to understanding the truth. And just maybe we'll finally be able to understand the final member of the Karnas family, the singularity. So I've had something to say about pretty much all of the Karnas species up until this point, but it's here where I really don't have a lot to go on. Much like the monoliths, Darian has kept the cards really close to his chest. He's kept a lot of it out of our hands, and maybe as a writing tactic, even out of his own hands. We've only seen a snippet of the singularities in any of the Vita Karnas episodes. On screen now are just all of the examples I could find of when we see them, but it seems like in-universe this is something that the government definitely wants to keep from the public. If this video were a lower deep dive, go deep in live dive door the roar video, it's here that I would go into the entire theory of the government covering up the threat posed to us by the Karnas, but that's not what we're here to do. But if we take the generally agreed upon lore, that is that there are singularities across the world and that they may be in part responsible for the Vita Karnas in the first place, we can again find ourselves at the cosmic horror of all cosmic horror in this series. I'm not sure about you, but I'm super curious about what's in the center of a black hole. Their mystery, gravitational strength, and the overall concept of what they are is just mind-boggling. It's assumed that if you were to jump into a black hole, you'd die. But we don't know that for certain. Why am I talking about black holes? Well, the alleged centermost point of a black hole is referred to as its singularity. Singularities, the carnies, are also represented as large black spheres that hover off of the ground. Not only are they so different from the other carnies in that way, I believe that their name is a direct reference to the singularities of black holes, that being a place at which our understanding of time, space, and physics collapses. Humanity loves to know things. I mean, as Carl Sagan once said, we are a way for the universe to know itself, and when there are things that we either can't or don't understand, it creates this mixture of curiosity and fear and anxiety. And I think that the singularities tap into that exactly. There's something that our minds can't even begin to process. Maybe when season two comes out, everything in this section, maybe even this video, will become obsolete. But until then, we'll have to just keep sitting around and mulling over our questions about these potentially godlike balls. Wait, and so, yeah, that's Vita Carnis. There is still a ton more that you can learn about the series. I mean, you can learn about the lore and the different Latin names of the Carnies creatures and all that. And if that's something you're interested in, I definitely recommend going and supporting Darien and all other content creators talking about Vita Carnis. It's a great series. Vita Carnis is probably my favorite analog horror series at this moment. I mean, I just love stuff that surrounds humanity and impossible odds and humanoid creatures and all kinds of stuff like that. I really hope you're as excited for the next season as I am, but I guess we'll just have to wait until the next season rolls around. Until then, I'm Danny Chase, and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Bye now.